fairly new to the carving thing, a couple of years. I, uh, before, I've been doing, uh, before carving completely destroyed everything about my lucrative photography career, um, I was just, just doing, bouncing around from, you know, getting out of school, and, and so I guess 20 years, 15 to 20 years, uh, just dealing mostly in photography, and, you know, there's the, with carving, sometimes you hear, or I hear, the bears are sometimes more of the rolling joke, you know, people making bears, lots of bears. Photography, painting, any art form really has its bears. Um, a lot of times you may or may not hear that photography, a wedding photographer might be considered to be doing the bears. But bears in carving, I'm trying to draw parallels and I'm a very non-linear thinker so you know, throw something at me if I go way off base or I just become confusing. But the bears as in wedding photography, anybody who takes control of any anything in any medium, you make it what you're going to make it. It becomes your own style. So, if you're doing wedding photography, you you tend to go more of the lazy route, and you get a routine, and you run through the moves, and you do standard portraiture, and you do things that get old, and and they're not progressive, and you don't change. However you can also take it to the other extreme. You become more of a photojournalism type photographer when you're shooting the weddings. And you do, as Bob was saying with carvings, you tell a story. And that becomes critical if you want to move more into an artistic realm. So, you know, I, I, won't, I won't even, I'll try to stay away from going any deeper into anything other than the basics. I just want to try and give everybody an idea of when you're, when you're taking a piece this is not mine, by the way. I just took it out of the back. But when you're taking a piece and you're and you're you're trying to move it around your shop or you're trying to take a photograph real quick, there's a lot of things that you need to avoid. You need to avoid the distractions. You need to avoid the things that are gonna that are gonna give you a photograph that really is more about the tools in the background of your shop and less about the piece that you're trying to that you're trying to you know uh, you're trying to make somewhat interesting or at least tell a story or what you had going on in that carving. Um, up on the board, I'm not sure how many of you have point and shoots, how many of you have SLRs. This is an SLR, single lens reflex. That's whenever you hear SLR, 35 millimeter. It's, it's a, you know, that's what you're dealing with. A point and shoot is not an SLR. That's my camera, this is the lens. Just, I'm gonna go real quick. Image comes in. It's a mirror. It, uh, Digital is changing everything, of course, but the SLR, the image comes in, hits a mirror, the mirror goes up into the viewfinder. That's what you're seeing. When you push the button, this mirror flips up out of the way, and the image hits what used to be a film plane back here. It hits the film plane, it records what the lens is seeing, and your image is exposed according to all the settings that you use. With digital, your film plane is no longer, obviously it doesn't exist anymore. You're, you, have a, you have a digital back that's highly sensitive and can't, doesn't do well with dust and all kinds of other stuff. I won't get into any of that because it's a whole other world. Um, beyond the camera, for just real quick, the basics. A lot of you have cameras. You usually, you, lot, you may or may not know what's on your camera. This is what you're going to see on almost every camera, wherever it's made, for mo all intents purposes. I, you know, we can't dissect everything here because it's just not. There's not enough time. Manual, aperture priority. A lot of people will have a, just an auto setting on their camera. Programmable S speed shutter, it, you know, a lot of things I'm not even sure, well, I know what they mean, but what they mean to me is a quick, it's when you look at your equipment, everything fires real quick, lighting, settings on your camera, background, everything, you know, just goes a lot quicker. As you guys know as carvers, you look at a piece of wood and you can move a lot quicker than someone like me who stands for three days staring at a chunk of wood trying to figure out 
what's interesting about the texture and not about where the carving is going to go. So the same thing applies for photography as applies for everything. You, you can't expect, if someone wants to come up to you, any of you experienced carvers, and, and say, how do I become a better carver? You get a saw and you start carving. With photography, it's the same thing. You're not gonna, you're not gonna get an answer that's gonna allow you to take better pictures. You will take nice pictures here and there, but you'll never be consistent. The only way to be consistent is to shoot. To shoot all the time and shoot with intent to be better. And that applies to almost everything that I, you know, that I can imagine. If, if you're gonna try to become more creative, or at least have control of the creativity in any of the medium, you just have to do it. That's, I mean, you just have to do it. There's no other way. Hundreds of thousands of photographs will put you in a position where you're still fumbling through when you come into a situation because lighting is always changing and so forth and so on. And you guys all know the deal. Same thing with when you're carving and you're on a new subject. Manual aperture priority programmable shutter speed or speed. <coughs> Set your cameras to, if you're setting your cameras to auto and you're going to work in that direction, that's great. But the cameras have a metering system in them. And if you're going to point in any direction, the metering system, unless you have a more expensive camera, which allows you to change the metering system, the metering system is going to take a broad scope of what you're pointing at. So if you point at a bright background with your carving sitting in the middle of the background, if you were to go up to this window, and you put your carving here, it's a silhouette. It's incredibly dark. The camera is going to read the window light, and it's going to make the outside exposed properly, and your carving is going to remain dark, if not darker. Because the metering systems are not Unless you have a spot metering system where you can dial it down, you need to get in and measure this and let your background blow out, which is really the most desirable thing that you can do. Your background needs to be illuminated. I can say that a thousand times because that seems to me from seeing the carving or pictures that people post, your backgrounds need to be eliminated. <coughs> your backgrounds need to be eliminated. So. When you're rolling through the uh, programs on your camera, if you're going to go into an auto mode, just expect that your photos are going to be somewhat out of your control. Nighttime. What are you going to do at nighttime? You're not going to be putting yourself in a position to do anything that pulls in, I don't want to say creative, but the ambient. If you go into a bar, you go into a, and I know nobody has ever been in a bar, but if you go into a bar or you go into your carving area, and it's nighttime, and you've got interesting lighting going on, your eye might not pick it up, but when you photograph later, and you end up with, a, with your carving, or whatever you're photographing, you end up with a piece with your flash hitting it, the camera is exposing for that flash, which is a horrible thing to do. Flash you should always turn off. But let's say you're going for your flat. Your flash exposes your piece. What ends up happening, when the flash hits this piece, all the gloss on it's going to glare out. The background will go dark. But if you were trying to create an atmosphere around your piece, you're going to fail every single time. Unless the lighting in your shop or studio or place around you is equal to or in the same range of the flash of your camera. Unlikely, it happens. Sometimes you get lucky. I get lucky. Every photographer, everybody everywhere gets lucky. You get great shots every once in a while. In order to have control of what you're looking at and trying to put it in a position where you, you have a, a photograph of your carving that, that, <coughs> that is, is how, you, how you envisioned it and something that you can use for maybe your website or your portfolio, you need to spend a little more time isolating your pieces <coughs> eliminating the backgrounds, and trying to go after some manual control. The manual is what I would prefer that anybody who goes out of here thinking is that you move into manual. You stay, you stay on the manual mode. You, aperture priority is really great. It allows you to control things, which I'm not even sure I even want to start to go into 
depth of field and, and all kinds of other fantastic stuff. But manual aperture priority, all that stuff, that's on your camera. The other thing you'll see the numbers jogging around all the time are your f-stops. 2, 8, 4, 5, 6, 8, all the way up to 22. This, which you also all see on your camera, is a meter. It's a light meter. You'll see it bounce from here to here to here. The center is the middle. That's what the camera is telling you is the proper exposure. The cameras are rarely right. A $5,000 camera won't give you exactly. You just have to shoot, and your eye will start to adjust. You'll start to know, I want to be two-thirds of a stop under, so forth and so on. I'm, I'm hesitant to go into stops, f-stops, and start bouncing around with the differences, because the math is there. When, when I started shooting, digital was not eating everything up like it is now. So you had to do the math. I've always failed math, every le grade level. I'm terrible at it. So it just took a matter of time before it just automatically clicked. I just look at dots and lines and symbols. I don't do any of the math in my head. I know that you know, compensating between shutter speeds and f-stops is a whole you know, it's just it's something you can talk to me privately, and I'll explain, or you know, afterwards, and I can explain to you, you know, the differences between dividing in half and doubling, and going back and forth with f-stops and shutter speed. The f-stops is your depth of field, or can control your depth of field. I have no idea if I'm even being coherent right now, but if you're going into a manual <laughs> mode, if you're going into a manual mode, it's going to allow you to. Take your photo, realize that everything's super bright or super dark, and you've completely screwed it up. But then you can, on your dials in the manual mode, you can control your f-stops and your shutter speed. So shutter speed is the other thing you'll see. You'll see 125, 250, 500. And then the other direction, it'll go down, you know, whatever, 180, all the way down to a quarter of a second or one second. You're not going to handhold one second. If you're shooting in the dark, you need a tripod. If you want to be able to shoot in a condition where you're able to, to get a proper exposure, I just don't see how anybody here can move forward in any way of trying to gain better creative control without having a tripod. You can get cheap tripods. You're not going to find a tripod that supports a camera this heavy for 30 bucks. But if you're dealing with smaller light cameras, you want to be really careful. You want to make sure you get a tripod where the ball head on here, which this is a ball head because it's got a ball in there, allows you to pivot. The ball head needs to be able to lock in position and hold the camera without tilting down. Because what will happen is you'll set up and you'll be futzing with what you're doing and it'll slowly start to tilt down. And then you've really just sort of set up your composition and, and gone all your cropping for no reason whatsoever. I, I think that, that if, if you can try to push yourself to go into your manual modes on your camera and play with that with the intent of photographing your pieces I, I think that, that that's probably going to solve a lot of your problems. Um, just real quick. So you're in your shop. You have your piece. Your piece is on the ground. Don't photograph your animal or whatever it is that you carve on the ground. Get it off the ground. I, 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 over and over again, and I know everybody's seen the photographs of the of the carvings on the corner of the shop with all the tools behind it. And, and it's, a, you know, it's an animal that was, even if it's this tall, it's down there and it's compressed in the corner of a shop. And there's sawdust and all the other stuff, which is whatever, it's there. It's easier for you just to go like this because maybe it's heavy, you gotta lift it. You wanna get the piece to eye level. I was able to lift this one so I could get it up and I'll adjust the tripod and move it up and down. If you do anything, get your piece off the ground and try to level out to the top two-thirds of the piece you're shooting. Two-thirds, okay, half, somewhere up in here. So I would go after trying to level my camera in a position that allowed me to shoot with the lens height roughly around here. I'm not saying this is how you do every animal, you do everything, 
I'm just saying if you're trying to go after where to start, a starting point, you want to try and hit somewhere in here. Don't level to the eyes. You can. If you're going in for details, it's beautiful. You can do that. The next thing you want to do after you get your piece off the ground, um, if it's huge, if it's really tall, then you're not going to lift it. You would need to try to get yourself much further away from the piece. Uh, I'll explain that in a minute, but just for real quick. Behind this right now, if I was going to take a photograph of this, right behind it is Chainsaw Art Competition, offices, life exceeding the dream, a cougar head in a basket, a bunch of pottery cups over there. And a wolf puppy. Yeah, and all kinds of stuff. What's going to happen is I broke my tripod recently because I don't know how to take care of anything. Manual mode. Don't forget manual mode. And backgrounds. And tripods. And yoga. <laughs> and mountain poses. And namaste. All right. This is going to fall off and everyone's going to laugh because I didn't put this on properly. Mm -hmm. Quarter. I don't have a quarter. A key. All right, so your piece is set up. You're in your sh you're in your studio. You've got it off the ground. The next thing to do is you're going to look and you're going to say, "All right, it's a big piece. I can't move it around. This piece is, you know, you can move this around." So I'm just going to pretend that that everybody carves this size or smaller, and nothing bigger exists. So what you're going to do is get it off the ground, get it somewhat level. I would probably go back as far as I could depending upon the length of your lens. And when I say length, I mean, is it a telephoto? Do you have 200 mils? Do you have whatever, whatever allows you to get further away? Do you want to use a telephoto as opposed to just have it in the shop? Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, anybody asks questions, because I really, honestly, I don't, I don't speak about this stuff. So I, I don't even, I'm so lost in my head right now, I can't even tell who I'm looking at. But, <coughs> yeah, the, the, the backgrounds, to eliminate backgrounds, you have two ways of doing that. You can do as I'm about to do, which is completely cover it, or you can start working with your depth of field. And that's what I was talking about up here. A 22 on your camera is going to give you much more depth of field. If you're out rolling through the Grand Canyon and you want to shoot landscapes, you would want to be here at 22. Explain depth of field. Yeah, depth of field is, yeah, I never even put a, uh, your depth of field is going to be, ISO and ASA are the same thing. I'm not even sure what's on cameras anymore. Something's on my camera. I don't even look anymore. That's film speed. Film speed, 100, 200, 400, 800, whatever it is. Some of your cameras go up to 3,200. They even go up to 6,400, which is just ridiculous. You know, back in the day. That's yeah, funny. I'd never say something like that. When, when film was pretty much the only thing, you would have to go out and purchase film. Purchase film based on the speed that you need to shoot. If you're going to be shooting at night, you would purchase 800 speed. And then you would push it in the camera. So when you dropped it off at the lab, it would be, you double it, 1600. Now on the cameras, you can go right up to 1600. What I would do is I would have to, you'd have to bounce back and forth between your film speed, which is, let's say we have it on a sunny day. I set it to 100, 100 ASA. At 100 ASA, at an f-stop of 22, on a sunny day, I should be able to have a proper exposure for an open field somewhere in a beautiful landscape. Your shutter speed is not going to be important anymore unless you're working with, unless you don't have a tripod and low light. It's really complicated, but your depth of field is everything from you to infinity. 
Your lenses do have an infinity marking on them. From me to infinity, what's in focus between me and infinity is your depth of field, really. How far does your focus actually pull in? What I do is when I'm looking at any situation, if I was going to shoot the heck and I wanted the wall to be in focus, then I would want to focus somewhere on the back. I know the thirds, you break it up into thirds, but I usually try to go, I want the cat to be most in focus, so I'll focus somewhere here, in the front third. If everything's important, then I would focus on the back two thirds, point the camera here, and then readjust to the cat. If you want it all in focus, your depth of field is only gonna, you're gonna wanna have your f-stop all the way back at a 22. Or, as best you can, depending upon how the exposure reads when you're changing your film speed. Bump your film speed all the way up if you're shooting at night, if you're shooting in a dark studio. Get the film speed way up there. Put it as high as it can. It will be grainier, but if you don't have a tripod, you're not going to be able to hand hold a one second exposure at a 22. If you want just the cat. If you want just the cat, and that's really, that's the most important thing if you're backing up. If you want just the cat, the problem is, is that the cat has depth of field from the tip of the nose to the tail, or to the back, wherever, whatever's back here. This depth of field becomes your most important issue if you're shooting this cat and you're moving up front close to it. The further away you go with a longer lens, the more it compresses everything from the background. And that's what I was talking about with depth of field. Everything becomes compressed. If you're shooting a giant bear, or a giant whatever you have, you want to move as far away as possible with as long a lens that allow you to crop in on your piece. You know, you want to give yourself a little bit of room. You want to be in here. You don't need to photograph all that stuff unless you're trying to leave room for a title because it's going on your web page. You know, composition is a whole nother, is a whole nother world. You just have to shoot, 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 and see what works best for you. Your piece, as you're shooting it, your depth of field from the tip of the nose to somewhere in the back of the cat, the best you can do is to focus on the eyes. All wildlife photographers focus on the eyes. Not all, not all the time. But the rule of thumb, if there is going to be a rule of thumb, is focus on the eyes because the eyes are what grab you. You know, I was, there's wildlife photos that are sitting right up there. Um, I was looking at those earlier and, and a lot, of, a lot of people are carving from wildlife photos. And then you're done with carving from the photo, and you then take a photograph, and you're not really sure how you should be photographing your carving. Go back and look at the photo that you just carved from. It's, it's really that easy. The photo that you carved from, if it was a good one, was shot by a photographer who has probably shot hundreds of thousands of wildlife photos and knows is not going to post something that's garbage. So if you're dealing with a decent photograph, you, you should try to mimic as close as you can the natural pose that was captured by that photographer. Um, you know, they're not, you're not looking at a, at, a, at a lion walking across the Serengeti, wherever he is, and he's on the, you know, on the floor compressed down there somewhere, and you're pointing down at him like this. The photographer's on his knees. He's way down here. And he's shooting down in here, and the cat is walking, and you end up with a, with a, with a, a non-distorted photograph, and the guy is obviously like half a mile away, but he's using a very long lens, and you'll notice that the background behind the cat is blurred, and all the focus is, is on being really sharp on the animal. That that is, you know, that's one way to control depth of field, obviously, because the guy is, you know, you, you know, you can't walk up to the cat and take a photo. It doesn't feel right. It wouldn't be natural. Much like uh, I remember last year, a few things always stick in my head. Someone mentioned about carving, um, I think it was Jeff. Uh, yeah, I think Sam Dusty was, was talking about carving an unnatural position of an animal. He said, well, if you were that close to a bear that was snarling, you'd probably be dead. It's the same thing with the photograph. Why would you want, you know, the, the, the sh photos you see are, are usually, they feel more natural because the animal's in its natural environment. So. Anyway, I'm getting lost in all that. Um, with, uh, with the cat and the depth of field, focus on the eyes. Always focus on the eyes. If you're going for something a little more creative, you want to move around the animal, obviously the eyes won't be right in front of you. If you want to get the whole animal, point just behind the head. Point a third of the way back. 
If anything goes out of focus, you're better off if it's the tail and not the face. Or nothing in here. Um, so anyway, eliminate the background. That's what we're going to do real quick right now. Because <coughs> I could think of a million ways in this room how I would shoot something, but I wouldn't. I would try not to shoot it. <coughs> All right, it's rough, and you're seeing everything around the cat. Oh, it doesn't even drop down that far. But that's all right. What did I do? With these? What's that? Nah, it's all right. It's uh, it just you know, that's the other thing you'll have to figure out real quick is that you can work in a much smaller space. If your eye is bouncing all over the place, just remember when you get behind the camera and you frame up, you're not seeing more than this. So, you know, I, I'm not saying this is exactly how I do it. This is just what was in my car and the easiest thing that I could try and work this out with what's gonna make sense for you guys you know, if you don't have equipment, whatever you have in your house, a white bed sheet. That can also be very useful. It's another way to create a quick background. Grab whatever you have, keep that material nearby, and if you get yourself into a routine, setting something up really quick, it just becomes, it becomes something that takes five minutes instead of half your day. I don't want to do the photography because then I got to get the stuff out and I don't know about the lighting and all that other nonsense. You just take out whatever material you have, you create your backdrop. Maybe if you have a place where you can keep it, you can always throw it up, clip it to the wall, clip it wherever you want. This animal, if I was to shoot him up against here, right now he's popping. He's popping a lot because he's against black. You know, black's always a good way to go because it allows you to, uh, it allows you to not have a real bright source it's not always the best way to go. I just think that if you're gonna, if you want to cut out what you're looking at and have and have, you know, no no uh, we'll have no uh, bleed over the edges. If it was a white background or a white sheet and, and it was reflecting light back, you'd end up with bleeding. Your your high spots on the on the cat, uh, wherever light was hitting, if you were trying to define the edges with any lighting, they would bleed over with a white background. It's very hard to give you really sharp edges. I think that with something like this, I'd want to have the edges to be real crisp. So that's why both the dark background works best for me. Um, of course, I go into Photoshop and I can cut anything out. So I don't even do this anymore. I'll shoot. I will shoot it with a bunch of crap in the background, and then go into Photoshop, cut it all out, and make the background whatever I want. But uh, we won't go into Photoshop. It's it's way too much. Um, how about they normally use uh, blue? Blue, oh, blue and green, yeah. Blue and green are, are two colors that, a green screen. Like uh, if you're ever watching how a movie was made or something like that, you'll see the green screens behind everybody. The green screens are, are for CGI. It's the easiest, it's chroma. It's a color that can be selected in post-production. So it, it's the it's it's just the, the chroma color. It allows it allows in post production allows them for, to go in and key out the background, and then they can put whatever you want in there. So if you got a you see a guy laying on a desk and he's supposed to be Superman and the background's green, you know they can key that out. You can select it. It's a software you know it's a software thing, but you select the green or the blue, but green is usually what's used, and then uh, and and light contamination doesn't become as much of an issue. So, yeah, I mean, if you have a green screen in your house, great. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's the best. Throw your shit, uh, your stuff against it and photograph that and jump on your computer and, you know, put it on top of the Empire State Building, whatever you want. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Chaz wants to know if you have a black bear, what yeah. color would you use? Yeah. With a black bear, I wouldn't put it against a black background, and that's exactly what I was talking about with bleeding over. If you have a... If you have a black bear then depending upon the size of it, I would go for a lighter background. Because, I mean, the contrast is really what you're going to be going after. If you're outside or you're anywhere in where the, the light source is massive, then you'd want to get as far away from your subject as possible and allow the background to blow out white. Overexpose the background. How would you do that? You Make sure the animal is in shade and make sure that everything else is in light or at least brighter, and that would blow out your background. 
there's so many ways to get rid of your background that I'm not even sure I would know where to begin other than the most Some basic. Some use that. Yeah. And it, you, I mean, controlling your background is everything if you want somebody's eye to follow what, wh where you want. You want to control where somebody looks. Um, if you're not doing that, then someone like me or someone else anywhere is going to take a peek at it and either eye is going to get lost. My eye will easily get lost on almost anything I look at unless it's controlled where I'm looking. I mean, I, you know, I bounce all over the place. I'll be looking up at the texture of this uh, up in here. I won't even be looking at this. But that's, you know, that's me. That doesn't mean that's what everyone does. Um, in this room, if I had to figure out what lighting I was going to use to light this piece, the first thing I would do is I would look up and I'd say, okay, I have fluorescent. <coughs> I have daylight. And I don't see any tungsten bulbs in here, but there's a decent amount of light coming into this room. I don't really see any big issues with this right now. If this was a face, I don't know, a big Indian head, whatever it was, and it had a, you know, a giant nose and facial features that were really chiseled and, and prominent and sticking out, a soft light is what you want because it wraps around it. I'm not, you know, these are soft, they're doing a decent job, we're also getting some kick from the side over there, and it's all mixing together and allowing whatever cameras you have on auto mode to say, okay, white balance, I'll let the color be what it is. If you have a face like this, you'll often see, if you're looking at portraiture of women or something that's supposed to be relatively beautiful, the light is usually as soft as possible, and that's because they're avoiding shadows. You would never put sunlight on this unless you wanted it real dramatic. It'll kick a big nose shadow across the side of the face. Same thing with all these. Directional light, I don't think directional light works very well for most of the carvings that I see. Directional light, which what I mean by directional is to take a light or sunlight and get a real strong source hitting here. Everything that sticks out will throw a shadow on the other side of your piece. In your shops, wherever you are, soft lighting. Soft lighting. These are relatively soft. The softest, best source you can look for is a giant window or a giant garage door. Uh, you know, when I look in this room, the first thing I would do is I, anybody who has a shop, I would go over to my garage door, I'd open the garage door and allow all that non-direct sunlight or light to come flooding in. You have, you have what you see when they're setting up on movie sets. <coughs> or what a photographer would be paid a lot of money to do. He'd come in, he'd bring a giant light and start throwing light grids on it and um, different types of uh, diffusion and soften, soften, soften. Give you a really big soft source. It's the easiest and most direct way to go after whatever you're shooting. Soft light. As big as possible. The bigger, the more spread and soft, the easier it's going to be for you to deal with the shadows and everything that will happen with your piece. The, with a face, when should we use a flash? What's that? Under any conditions we should use. I a would flash. All, I would never use a flash unless it was dark, <laughs> darker than all, you know, dark as a. What did he say? Darker than a black steer's took us on a moonless night. Yeah, I can't remember that. It, I would go. I would go for. I would go for whatever. I hate flash. I hate it. I, I almost never use it. As a matter of fact, I'd probably take out a. a uh, I'd probably light a candle or a big lighter and take my tripod and put it on a five second exposure and, and start a fire over here. That's, that's probably what I would do actually. I'd go in my house and I'd get a big china ball light. You know, you'd big, the big uh, paper lantern lights. I would get one of those and I would run an extension cord or if I happen to have access to electric. And I would put a big soft light source up in here and I'd set my camera up for a four second exposure and I would just push the the shutter button, and I'd let it expose for five seconds, or however many seconds it took. And believe me, that light at five seconds, you'll get exposure all over this. And I guarantee it'll be more beautiful and much more interesting than if you walked up and took your flash and blasted away at this thing. <coughs> you need, that's why I was saying before, it's impossible for me to explain all the different ways. You need to start playing with the light. If you're not playing with the light when you're shooting, and you're relying on your flash or whatever happens to be in front of you, you're really not going to make any headway. You're not, you're not going to be able to start to capture these things the way you want them. How much does it cost to hire a photographer? Uh, it depends. Is it, <coughs> is it somebody who's really hungry? <laughs> you know, is it, is it a student who 
just wants the opportunity. You know, I, that that's a really tough question. That's the same thing as, you know, a car asking a carver to carve something. Hey, you know, we're having a we're having a big show out in front of our store, and we know you're <laughs> brand new at this. So all the exposure you're going to get, and you know, all that stuff. It's so I'll do a lot of a lot of uh, projects just based on whether or not it's interest, interesting to me, and then I'll just assume that I'm not going to eat that week. But that's just me. I mean, I go after the project. I never go after the money. I mean, I just totally flattened my. I just I just dis, just recently dismantled my entire life uh, in order to make sure that I can just carve because it's you know I kind of feel like I finally found what I was looking for, and uh, with photography I love photography but. <laughs> I, as soon as I started, realized that carving existed, and I found the, all the stuff online, the forum, and I jumped and I saw Ridgeway, I, as soon as I started, I was like, well, that's it. I got rid of it. I started selling my equipment, and it was probably only like five months ago that I was finally able to tell everybody who I've ever worked for, I was like, don't call me anymore, ever. <laughs> like, what are you, what are you joking? Just don't. Just lose my number. And you know what? They're not calling. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, are you calling them? <laughs> I'll tell you something. Yeah. Hey, by the way, if I haven't said thank you to all of you, thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks a lot. So, um, hey, Seaman, is there a better time of day to shoot for natural light? Yeah, that you know, it depends if this if it depends. Is it cloudy out? Is it sunny out? It depends upon what you're dealing with. Um, you know, I don't know where I am with time. Someone told me to shut up at any point in time, but it depends upon where you are with the with the sunlight. Um, the sunlight that's pouring through those windows right now is very bright and fantastic, but you wouldn't want to be out in direct sunlight right now. It's brutal. Never in the middle of the day. For soft light, these windows are perfect. I mean, this soft light coming through here, wrapping around here, will always give you the most beautiful portraiture that you can look for, a soft light source. If anybody's shooting a, a person's face, if you just spent a week, a month, however long carving a human figure, and you want to photograph that figure, and you really love the face, and you feel like you did such a fantastic job, move it over to a window, if you can. Get the face next to a window, and allow that soft light to wrap around the face. You know, I can't even, I can't even reach in there, but if you push the face in there, you'll, you'll frame up a nice photograph. You'll realize how important it is to have a soft light source. Yeah, all these, the, cloud, the, cloudy, the cloudy days are really what you want to go for in terms of shooting your stuff. If you're going to drag it outside, either in the shade or a nice cloudy day, because basically when it's cloudy, You've got the biggest soft light source you can possibly imagine. And that's really what you want to go for, I think. Uh, that's what I do. In other words, uh, all the carvings down at the site, when's the best time to walk around and forth, right? Yeah, that's a tough one. It, it's a... Uh, it, it, if it's... Yeah, I mean, you, you want indirect sunlight. Unless you really want it to be dramatic. I, for me personally, I have I almost never get any carvings done because I get lost in texture and you know to me I'm like you know I'll start playing with the leg and start chainsaw drag and and then I'll take a light and I'll walk around my shop at night and I'll take light and I'll move the lights around and I'll find how the light breaks across the texture and then I'll go in and I'll start photographing pieces of texture. You know what I mean? It, it, my mind does, I, I, I don't know how to s explain that to most people because it's my mind doesn't work the way yours does. Yours doesn't work the way that person does. For me personally, it's never about the bigger picture. I, I get lost and lost. I'll never, I'm never going to make any money. I'm going to be, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, cloudy day, soft light source. For walking around the rendezvous, if you're going to photograph people's pieces, Direct sunlight hitting this dead on when the sun is maybe coming up. Or I'm not sure depending upon which direction you are. If the sun is shining directly on the piece and it's and it's really giving you a beautiful golden cast or or it's giving it head to toe light dead on. I mean that's what you're going to get. Shoot it. Either that or have somebody following you around with a giant, you know, diffusion cloth and you know blocking the sun out for you. That's what you know. That's what you would have to do. You'd have to put something in front of the sun. But you know, this sunlight hitting here, dark and light. I, if, if you if it's a reference, that's just the wrong way to go. I, you know, you want to get something a little bit clean. 
Um, so I, I'd wait for the sun to move or wait for a cloud. Look up at the sky. Take your time. Don't don't walk around. Snap, 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 snap. Pick pick five. Pick. Give yourself. I'm only going to take ten photographs all day. You know. And then those ten photographs. Spend your time making sure that those are the best ten photographs that you take. Instead of going home with two hundred photos. Hey, hey, oh, look at all the photos. Put them in a folder. Never look at them again. End up with a million photos on the hard drive of your computer. Just shoot like five or so, five or ten. Get them, get five or ten really nice ones and deal with it that way. Yeah. No, I haven't shot film in. I yeah, I'm, I only shoot digital now. Okay, that's why you mentioned film. Yeah. It's it's a nightmare. It's a it's a total nightmare. The archiving is a total nightmare. I've got slides and negatives and piles all over my house and in closets and you know I don't even know if I'll ever look at those again. Now the same thing. My computer is growing with giant files all over my computer. Yeah, but okay, you 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 said just take five or ten uh, pictures. Well, what's what's opposed to taking you know like. Uh, like like a hundred pictures and then just uh, deleting the bad ones. Yeah, well you can do that, but how much time did you take on the hundred? Yeah. Did yeah. you did you just snap and move on to the next one? Oh wow, look, that's really interesting. Click and you walk away. What you should be doing is you should say, what time of day is it? Where's the sun? Maybe I'll come back and do that cat at five o'clock when the sun has dropped. Maybe I'll do that person's because well, when the sun rotates, yeah. when you approach a subject, don't don't assume that this is where you should shoot it every time. You gotta move around. The same way when you carve, you, you gotta move around. You gotta step all the way back here. If you wanna, you know, do this, do this. Give yourself a little bit of, you know, cropping and framing with your hands. Try to figure out where the right level of this piece is. Do you want to be here? Do you want to move back over here? I mean, for me, I could find pieces all over this animal that I want to go for. They don't necessarily mean it's the entire, the entire cat. I might want just in here. You know, I might want this square right in there. It, that's that's why you just have to shoot. But but if you're going to explore one piece, explore it from all angles. Look at the light that you're dealing with. How does the sun move across the sky? Where would I put a light? All these things come into play. And then take your photo. Maybe take two or three of the same piece. But but you know you, you want to you want to spend a little bit of time thinking about what you're doing because if you're just clicking clicking clicking. <coughs> Then, then you're not really going to be, you're not concerning yourself with them yeah. getting better or, or having quality. Yeah. yeah. If, uh, it's a bright day uh, as far as your shutter speed goes. I mean, just on an average, say you've got to take a picture outside. It's bright and say, oh, I'm only here for a little while. I just Sunny want to see this. You know, say uh, you want to set the, say I want to set the uh, uh, aperture. Uh, Say maybe 11, 16 if it's real bright, just so that, you know, like when people see something, they squint so that the, the aperture is real small. Even though the number is larger, you're making the aperture very small yeah. so that you're letting in less light. Yep. Whereas if it's dark, you want to go to something like 4, maybe uh, 2.8. 2.8. 2.8, you're still going to get some kind of shape in your hand, you know, depending on yeah. time. Right, but, that, but that's... <laughs> Your, ap your aperture sits inside, it sits at the end of your lens. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a series of leaves that overlap one another. That's not really what it looks like, but these, when your aperture is adjusted, those leaves open and close. A 22 is closed all the way down with only a little bit of light coming through. A 28 is all the way open, letting all the light through. That's the two ends. If you're going to be adjusting your exposure based on shutter speed and aperture, a sunny day at 100 speed ASA, sunny 16, the rule of thumb. Put it on 16, you know, but, but you have auto modes on your camera, so you don't really have to do all that math. That's the thing, is going from a 22 to a 16 at 125th of a second, is, you know, just, uh, a, just on an average though, we usually, you know, on an average light day, you probably be about 5.6. Uh, well, if, it, if the sun is direct, your sunny 16, I, sunny 16 is the rule, it's always sticks in my head. But, okay. Yeah, I mean, at 100 ASA, let's say. Okay. You know, this, this has to be adjusted as well. 
it, it's let's say it, let's say it's like spotty out here just average pictures, so probably five so, you know, yeah, yeah, right. the direct sun. Yeah. And then if it gets darker towards the darker part of the day, go down to four. Point eight, a little bit wide, but the problem with adjusting along here is this controls your depth of field. Yes. So if it's getting dark, this is why I was saying manual of the tripod. If it's getting dark outside and you want depth of field, your camera is going to want more light because it's getting dark. It'll put you down in here. But you want depth of field, so you need it up here. So you would have to bump up your sensitivity as high as possible, drop your shutter speed way down until, you know what I mean? You have to adjust until your meter becomes proper. Adjust your shutter speed way down, maybe a quarter of a second, maybe a second. So if you're going to hand hold your camera for a second, it's getting really dark out, right? It's getting really dark. I want depth of field. I put it up at 11 or 16. But now that means because I've, had, I've closed the lens, I now need to have a longer expo uh, shutter speed and shutter speed means this flips up for a quarter of a second, click, 500th of a second, click, really quick. You'd have to brace yourself against the wall, you have to find something to do this, or you get yourself a tripod. That's the only way to really do it. Yeah. So what's your motivation? Carving, photography? Oh, carving. I, photography for me now is just, you know, I still do it for some people, but only because they... You know, they, I earned a lot of money off them in the past. <laughs> but they, they all lost, they, nobody really calls me. I just a couple of randoms that I'll still go after. But for me now, I don't even play on the computer anymore. I don't, I don't even work on my, my fine, the fine art stuff I was doing, photography. Now I'm just outside. I'm really not, you know, I really don't get much done carving. But I, the photography for me is like, I, I'm losing it quickly. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, I used to use a simple camera and you can't do I don't do all those things. But to get the best pictures at the events, they always have those canopies over. So I found if I went before the sun came up, yeah. you know, when it's really good light, yeah. I didn't get the shadows. Because I got so many pictures of Bob's work yeah. that I didn't get a picture until last minute and it's cut in half. I know, I all shadows. the guys with the can you know, I went I went around the other day to try and grab <coughs> some photos and it's so dark underneath some of those canopies. So the, the best way to do it is you have to wait for your background to be somewhat even with the inside and then and then go to a tripod or find something to lean against. I mean, your camera's a point and shoot, so the flash is gonna wanna go off. Yeah, that's, I'm learning. Yeah, that's difficult. The, the way I would handle a dark environment where I had no choice is I would take my tripod and I would try to see what I could get with just a really long exposure. I, I know it's not really attainable with a point and shoot or especially if you don't have a tripod. Your flash, you know, you might... Yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> yeah, you can you can diffuse your flashes. You can take a little piece of gel and put it over, and it'll give you soft light kicking out. That's a great trick if you can find you can find gels and things like this. This type of material. You get a little piece of this, put it over your flash, and then a much softer light will come out. It'll be closer to that. That's one. But yeah, it's that's that's a tough call. That's like I was you know like I was saying. It's kind of the equipment the equipment sometimes will only allow you to do so much. Right. If you don't have manual control on your camera, you're not going to be able to play with that. Yeah. On a point to that, with uh, as as carvers, when you're setting up and carving, uh, make sure your carving is in a position for someone that's coming through and taking pictures, because no one wants to go in there and touch your carving yeah. to position it. And sometimes you get done and you just walk away and leave it turned around backwards or something like that. And keep in mind that people will be taking pictures of you. You want to have it in the best position as you can before that. I, I, the car shooting the carvings is difficult. I wait for the sun. I wait for it to be cloudy. I wait for it to be early or late in the day, and I, I shoot them then. I, I won't shoot with direct sunlight. I hate it. I, it's a horrible way. Well, to even, even with these point and shoots, you, uh, you you can't even see nothing in your viewfinder when when it's really bright out. You know what? Uh, yeah, it's just it. it you, you 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 wait till it's like early, like early when it's still, you know, uh, like say soft light, and then you can you, you can see your future shutters or whatever. Yeah, just do yourself a favor and wait for the light. If you can, you wait for the light to soften. Yeah, no, I mean for the carver themselves, they have oh, right, right. carving in a position. So because yeah. sometimes you'll see a carving, you can go up, you want to move it to get a good shot of it, but you don't want to move someone's carving that you don't know. Yeah, no, that's what I mean. 
You know, when you have to shoot, when you have to do, make do with what you got, that, that's just, you gotta, you gotta have to think, you have to reach into your bag of tricks and, and if you have a bag of tricks. Or you just keep shooting and eventually you'll figure out how to work your way around those things. One, one other thing too is, uh, these fluorescents up here, and the daylight outside, and all the lights that I, I've seen in a few people's shops, um, Brett, right, um, that the lighting in your shop is awesome, is totally awesome. awesome. <laughs> it's so awesome. I just, I, you know, I just quickly, quickly want to just, your lighting in your shop, if you can, don't use tungsten bulbs. Don't use regular light bulbs. Um, try and stay away from that yellow cast. Your eye might not pick it up because you adjust to it. Regular light bulbs in your house, everything's on a Kelvin scale. I, I, I know Kelvin doesn't really mean much, but it's, it's 3,200 degrees Kelvin, let's just say for a, for a regular light bulb, is warm, considered very warm. That light, as it's coming through the window right there, it's more like 5,600, maybe maybe more, higher, a little bit lower. If you can do fluorescence in your shop, go with fluorescence and try to create, on your ceiling, try to create some sort of a wraparound circle if you can. This works fine, the spread is kicking out, it's overlapping, you, these fluorescent lights are giving you nice even cast in here, but for you and your carving area, in order to carve for what's properly balanced for your eye, for what's properly balanced for the lighting conditions at somebody's home, you want to look at your pieces <coughs> in the light that's not going to surprise you the next day. You know, if you're carving in, in contrasty light with, with tungsten regular light bulbs and it's very warm glow, when the daytime rolls around, things might look very different to you. You may or may not be surprised or upset. All I'm trying to say is, when you shop for these bulbs, you'll see numbers on them. 4,800, 3,200, 5,600, 6,000. The higher the number on a fluorescent bulb, the closer to daylight, meaning the light outside. Not direct sunlight, that doesn't count. The light that's coming from daylight. It's very blue, it's got a lot of blue in it. That blue is because it's higher on the Kelvin scale. The color temperature is higher. So 5,600 degrees, when you're shopping for fluorescent bulbs for your shop, look for 5,600, 4,800 in that range, and that range will give you closer to daylight and will be better for you to carve in and much better for you to photograph in and also give you a softer cast in your studios and your workspaces. I mean, that, that's just, you know, if you can swing it, try to stay away from light bulbs. I, I, they're just, they're not, not a good way to go. Um, Anyway, so eliminate your backgrounds. I know time is probably way past. I don't even know what time it is. I don't know where I am. 10:57. Okay. So let me let me get out of here. I, I aside from throwing a million details of things that may or may not even sink in and may be making no sense whatsoever, the most important thing you should walk away with is eliminate the backgrounds on your pieces. Eliminate the backgrounds. Deal with soft light and play a little with your light and move around your subject and, and, and you'll at least begin to do a little bit of a better job with your, with your photography on, your, on all your carvings. Um, yeah, I, that's, that's, uh, I'll, if you have any questions, you can just find me at, at any point in time and if you wanna, if you have a carving, we, you want me to come over to your carving area and we can set up and it probably makes so much more sense than me spitting out all kinds of random garbage up here. I just don't need that. Did you take the picture yet? No. No, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, it's all up here. Shouldn't you take the lens cap off? <laughs> you never take the lens cap off. That's very, uh, very non-professional. Yeah, um, and that's, uh, I mean, I, I won't go into any more. It's just, you do the best you can with what little you have in your shop. Deal with lighting that's a little bit softer. Eliminate your background. You should be able to do, you know, you should be able to get better than, than pointing down at the floor and showing that you have a shop vac and a grinder and gas cans and all kinds of garbage in the background. It, spe it speaks better to people who are looking at your carvings if you are showing that you took time to present them with something that you care about.
I, I think you, I think you you could do that through your photography. You know, I, it might be the greatest carving in the world, but if you're presenting it in the corner of your shop with tools all around it, I don't know. I I lose interest pretty quick. Oh, one last thing, one really really important thing. You have 20 photographs. You're going to create a website. You want to show people your work. You have 20 photographs. You don't know if you like them. There's a few that you like, a few that you don't. Throw out all of the ones that you don't like or that are questionable and just show people a handful, five. You don't have to show them that you carved an owl and this and a bear and an eagle and a, and a mouse and a dog and all these things. You just want to pick out the three of your favorite. Less is more. People remember your worst photograph. They're not going to remember your best, they're going to remember your worst. If you show them a terrible carving, a photograph of your worst carving, it's, you're not showing them range, you're showing them the possibility of what they might get if they hire you. So don't show your worst photograph, and don't show your worst carving, and don't photograph your worst carving. <laughs> Just a few of your best, that's it. A few of your best. Okay. Very, Very good. good, thank you. Very good. Thank you.